morning, everyone. Welcome to the session. Um, while we're getting everyone into the room, feel welcome to introduce yourself in the chat box. And if you wanted to share your connection to transplant uh, in the chat box as well, that would be great. Um, I'm Gina Petty. I am the executive director of the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. And um, my connection to transplant is that uh, cardiomyopathy is a leading cause of transplants, um, heart transplants in the pediatric population. So CCF offers a range of different services uh, to support families with education, resources, advocacy, awareness, and advancing research. I encourage you to visit us in the exhibitor area of the Zoom platform and feel welcome to reach out for more information on any of our services. Um, but it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the genetic testing before and after transplant session. Please feel welcome to type in your questions using the chat box or the Q&A feature on your control panel within Zoom. Um, we will keep track of the questions and ask them afterward. Um, this session is a pre-recorded talk, but please feel welcome to ask your questions and we will get you um, feedback after the presentation. Um, so I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's session um, and introduce you to the presenter, um, Dr. Haas Tabriziani, who is medical director of organ transplant at Natera. And Dr. Tabriziani will be sharing information on genetic testing to empower caregivers, uh, to make informed decisions for their child. Um, please feel welcome to uh, kick off the presentation. Thank you, Melissa. Hello, thank you for joining our symposium in the Transplant Families Patient Meeting this year. I'm Dr. Haas Tabriziani. I'm a transplant nephrologist and the Senior Medical Director of Organ Health and Transplantation here at Natera. I want to talk about the tests that we have which can help the uh, patients pre-transplant and post-transplant for a successful journey. First, we're going to talk about genetic testing and evaluation for transplant patients. As per National Kidney Foundation, NKF data, about one third of adult American, they are suffering from chronic kidney disease or CKD, or they're at high risk for developing the kidney disease. One from every seven adults in the United States or about 15% of the populations are suffering from CKD, which counts about 37 million people. Unfortunately, 90% of the people with a kidney disease don't know even they have the kidney disease. And if you look at the severe kidney disease, two out of the five adults with severe kidney disease, they still don't know that they're suffering from kidney disease. About 2,444,000 Americans, they're living with a kidney transplant as the data as 2019, and about 786,000 of people in America living with end-stage renal disease. So that shows the magnitude of the CKD and why is it very important to diagnose this disease early. If you look at the kidney disease and why genetic is important in evaluation of the kidney disease, one in every four people with a chronic kidney disease, they have a family history of the kidney disease. If you go to the pediatric, actually that rises up to one from every five child with the diagnosis of the chronic kidney disease, they have a genetic cause. And if you look at the children with the end-stage renal disease, that actually increased in two in every five child with the end-stage renal disease, they have a genetic cause. And if you look at into the adult, one in every 10 adults who has chronic kidney disease, there is a genetic cause for that. So you can see that genetic disease play a major role in developing chronic kidney disease. But what is gene and why do we call it genetic disease? So all of us as a human, we are made of smaller uh, particles, which they call it cell. Inside the cell, there is a part which we call it nucleus. Inside the nucleus, there is the genetic information 
which are all together, which they form chromosomes. And if you look at those chromosomes more in detail, they're consistent of DNAs. And the DNAs, if you again look more detail into that, are consistent of genes. As a human being, we share many genes that make us human. But there are some genes which separate us from each other. Those are like, for example, your eye or hair color. Those are the changes that you see with the different genetic differences that it is available between the individuals. The genetic changes can be passed down the families through the parents to the children. And when there is a positive result of the genetic kidney disease, all the blood related family members like the biological parents, sibling, children, cousins, and other relatives, they have a chance of up to 50% to have the same genetic changes. I said up to 50% because it depends on the inheritance pattern, that percentage change. And we're going to talk about the difference inheritance pattern. So the benefit of identifying one person with a genetic disease is not only for that person, but also for the other family members who are at risk for developing kidney disease. Sooner you diagnose the kidney disease is better for the patients and the outcome because there are treatments available in some cases to stop the kidney disease and in most cases, at least to slow down the progression of the kidney disease. Also, it gives us an important information regarding the potential donors, especially when the family members want to donate to their loved ones. There are different patterns of inheritance uh, genetic kidney disease. They call it X-link, autosomal dominant, and autosomal recessive. What are the differences? The x links means the gene which has been like mutated. The gene mutation means there is a gene which is not as it's supposed to be. So we call it mutated gene. So these gene mutation, if it's on the X chromosomes, they just pass through the X chromosome from the parents to the children. So they call it x link. If it's not on the uh, uh, sex chromosome, which is the X and Y, we call it autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. What is the difference? You know, all of us from each of these genes, we have two copies, one from our father and one from our mother. If it's autosomal dominant means if just one of these genes that we are receiving is mutated, we are gonna show the disease. But in the autosomal recessive form, we need both of those genes to be mutated to show the disease. And if there is just one of them, we're not going to show the disease. And we have this test in the Natura. The name is Renocyte. Renocyte is a test which you can do on the saliva or the blood sample to see if there is a genetic cause for your kidney disease and also understand if you or your family member are at increased risk for developing kidney disease. It can identify all form of this pattern that we just discussed, the X-link, autosomal recessive, and autosomal dominance, and is consistent about 385 genes which can cause kidney disease. It includes a wide variety of conditions from the very common ones to the ones that we call them rare diseases. Also here at Natera, we support the patients for testing with the program and services. And usually the results is take up to three weeks uh, for you to see the results of your test. The benefit of genetic testing in transplantation, it can be for the transplant candidate or for the living donor candidates. So the transplant candidate, First of all, pre-transplant, it establish or specify a clinical diagnosis because unfortunately, a lot of the people who require kidney transplantation, they get diagnosed very late in the course of their kidney disease to the point that even if the physician do the biopsy, they cannot identify why they lost the kidney. With the genetic testing, there is another tool for the physician to have a specific diagnosis that why do they lost the kidney to start with? Why is it very important? 
because some of the disease have the tendency to recur after the transplant. So if you know what are you dealing with, you can monitor the patients for the recurrences. And if it recur, you know how to treat them. Also, like in most of the genetic disease, these diseases are associated with some other features other than kidney disease. So by identifying a correct diagnosis, you can look at the other organ which can be affected by this genetic disease. And for the living donor candidate, you can use this test because you can identify at-risk donor who don't have the clinical features of the disease, but they have the genetic mutation, means they're at risk for developing this disease later in life. And you can establish the best donors and determine the risk of decreased allograft survival. So for the kidney donors, there are some recommendations. There is an organization which uh, kidney, called Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcome, or KDGO. This is a work group that they work for different aspects of the kidney disease, and they will come with some guidelines. So the Living Kidney Donor Work Group have some recommendation. They suggested that the donor candidate should be asked about their family history of kidney disease. And also they recommended that the donor candidates found to have a genetic kidney disease that can cause kidney failure should not donate. Also, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, or OPTN, they require some medical evaluation for kidney donors. And the medical evaluation of living donors, they recommend that should have personal history of genetic renal disease. And they also recommend that all the hospitals must develop and comply with a written protocol for polycystic kidney disease or other inherited renal disease as indicated by family history. That shows how important it is to ask about this disease and also to investigate with the genetic testing to make sure that these donors are not having those genetic mutations. Let's talk about some examples. Let's meet Angela, a kidney transplant recipient. Angela had the end-stage renal disease secondary to unknown etiology. She got her first kidney transplant. And just a few months after receiving the kidney transplant, the kidney started deteriorating. At the time, they thought it's a rejection. So she was treated with current uh, recommended antibody-mediated rejection treatment with plasmapheresis, but unfortunately, she lost the first kidney transplant. Later on, she received the second kidney transplant. And at the time, again, after just a few weeks, she starts showing the deterioration of the transplanted kidney. At this time, a renocyte test was done, and we found that she has a disease, we call it atypical HUS. Why is it very important to diagnose this disease? Because this disease has a tendency to recur in the transplanted kidney. At this time, we knew that when the kidney deteriorates, it's not because of the rejection and it's because of the recurrence of this disease. So she was appropriately uh, treated with a treatment for this disease, which is a drug named Eclusimab. So this is a great example to show that Angela lost her first kidney transplant because they didn't have a correct diagnosis of why she lost the kidney, her own kidney to start with. And when it recurred in the transplanted kidney, they didn't know what are they dealing with. So they were not able to treat the patient properly. But she was able to preserve the second kidney transplant because of this accurate diagnosis and appropriate treatment. Also in this case, since we know the inheritance pattern of atypical HUS, the other family member who are at risk for this disease will also get tested, and some of them identify with this disease so they could be under a care of a kidney doctor and hopefully get treated. Let's look at another example. Let's meet Dave and Mike. Dave is a 60-year-old male who clinically diagnosed with a polycystic kidney disease at the age of 30. He denies any family history, but he said 
her mo his mother died of some kind of kidney disease in the 60s. Now at the age of 60, he's diagnosed with the end stage renal disease and he wanna get transplanted. So the transplant workup was started. His son, Mike, who was 25 year old, wanted to donate to his father. So he underwent the usual workup, which including the ultrasound and ultrasound didn't show any cysts. But the father was very concerned. And he said, you know, my son is just 25 year old. Even if he doesn't have a cyst right now, how can I be sure that he does not develop cyst later on in life? And that was a very valid concern because a lot of these genetic disease may not show themselves immediately and it may be later on down the life. So in this case, um, Dave get tested with the renocyte and he found to have polycystic kidney disease or PKD1 gene mutation. The son get tested and it was negative. That means the son do not have the same genetic disease as his father. So the father was reassured that this is a safe donation and the uh, son was able to donate the kidney to his father. So you can see the clinical utility in genetic testing in this example that father and the physicians, we are all reassured that this is a safe donor and Mike is eligible to donate the kidney to his father and help his father. So this is a great example of how to use the genetic testing when you're evaluating for the family member as a living donor. With Renocyte, also you have access to a complementary genetic information session with a board certified genetic counselor before and after the testing. So if you have any question regarding the genetic testing and how it may affect you, you have a free genetic information session included with your testing with our genetic counselor. And after the test, your physician first review the results with you. But if there is further question, again, this is available to you to answer your questions. So how should you request for the Renocyte? You can request the Renocyte uh, and you can scan this QR code and get more information about that. You can receive the Renocyte kit from the Natera. You can collect the sample. Uh, again, it can be just from your saliva and you take the kit to your doctor and your doctor can send the uh, test and then it comes to Natera and we will send the results to you and your physician in about three weeks. And as I mentioned earlier, you can schedule a genetic information session prior to the testing and after when you receive your test results. Let's change gear and talk about the other test that we have here at Natera to help transplanted kidney and that donor drive cell-free DNA testing. Do you know that 20 to 30% of the kidney transplant failure usually happen in the first five years? And about 50% of the kidney transplant failure happen within the 10 years? And most of these things is because of active rejection. Active rejection is one of the complication after the kidney transplant that can happen immediately in days, weeks, or months, or way later, years later. Why it, why is happening and what is active rejection? Our body is very smart. Our body is able to identify any foreign material which enter our body. And the system is responsible for identifying and fighting any foreign things come to our body is immune system. When a patient gets a kidney transplant, the body can identify this kidney as non-self and start attacking that because it's thinking it's something bad. And with the medication that the patients are taking after the kidney transplantation, we decrease this immune system and we try to fool the immune system not to identify the transplanted kidney as a foreign body. But in many occasions, the body is able to identify that and attack the kidney and that's rejection. Let's remember rejection is a process and it's not one point in time. So if you identify the rejection earlier during the course, you're able to work with your physician and there are intervention to stop the rejection or even in certain cases, reverse the rejections. 
So it's very, very important to identify the rejection as soon as possible because the treatment plan can help you to protect your kidney. How does Prospera work? Remember, we talked about the DNA being in the nucleus of the cell. When the cell die or get injured, this DNA is releasing into the blood. So when we receive the blood sample from the patient, we're looking at these free DNAs in the blood. We are able to identify what part of these DNA is from the donor and what part is from the recipient by looking at the part in the DNA which separate the individuals from each other. And then we report that in two ways. If more than 1% of these free floating DNA in the blood is from the recipient, we say, hey, most possible there is something wrong in that kidney and this kidney is high risk for rejection. We also report that as a score of quantifying of how much of that is the donor drive cell-free DNA as a copies per ml. And if that's more than 78 copies per ml, again, we put that patient at a high risk for rejection. We have a personalized assessment of your transplant over time. As you can see in this graph, at a different point in time, we give you this fraction and you can look at the trend if it's going up, coming down, so you have a better understanding of what's happening to your transplanted kidney. This is highly accurate screening test for active rejection. It's reliable and it's able to detect the kidney transplant rejection early and we can detect patient at risk for rejection better than the traditional labs. It's non-invasive. If you compare that to the biopsy, which is an invasive procedure, this is just a blood test. And it can be drawn around the same time that you have your other blood tests need to be done. And it's also accessible, suitable for most kidney transplant across all the ethnicities and the ages of older than 10 year old. Why we say this is more accurate than the current uh, testing that we are using? If you look at this diagram, you can see if from 100 people with the rejection, if you just look at the serum creatinine, the marker that now we use more frequently, you're able to identify 52 of them, and you're going to miss 48 of those rejections. That gives this test a sensitivity of 52%. Not much better than flipping a coin of the 50-50%. But if you look at the Prospera, you're, identified to, uh, you're able to identify 89 of these patients with active rejection, which gives the sensitivity of 89%. It's very important to know that Prospera really is the answer of an unmet need, uh, that with the current testing, they are not sensitive enough to identify rejection. It does not replace any of the testing that we are doing, but it just adds up another test to the toolkits for the transplant team to monitor the transplanted kidney. So we have the serum creatinine as we reviewed them together. It's a lagging indicator and it's non-specific. There is also another test, donor-specific antibodies, or DSA, which I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with these tests. This test is also not shown in a different study that is not very reliable because even in the antibody-mediated rejection, in many cases, the DSA is negative. And the other issue with the DSA is when your care transfer from your transplant center to your general nephrology center, this is not the test that they usually order and monitor the transplant patient with. The other form of getting information about your transplanted kidney is biopsy, but we all know biopsy is costly, is invasive, has some logistical issues, and it carries some risk because it's an invasive procedure. But Prospera is a non-invasive, highly accurate, donor-drive cell-free DNA biomarker, which can help your physician to identify uh, the acute rejection early in the course. There are some exclusion criteria for Prospera, means you can do Prospera in this kind of uh, patients. The important ones, I highlighted a few of them here. First one is you cannot do the Prospera in the first 14 days post-kidney transplant because after the surgery, there is 
many things happening in the body and there is a lot of those free floating DNAs in the blood. So it's not gonna be accurate. Our test has been validated for the recipients of the kidney transplant of 10 year of age and older. So it has not been validated for younger children yet. Also, if there is another form of the cell-free DNA in the body. So let's imagine what can that be? For example, pregnant ladies, which may have another kind of cell-free DNA in their blood, which is from the fetus, or if there is an active cancer, because cancer have different kind of cell-free DNA. Again, so there is another form of the cell-free DNA in the blood from the cancer, or if the patient had other organ transplant from other donors, all of them can interfere with the Prospera, so they should be excluded. The only exception about the multi-organ transplant is the SPK, or simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant, because they come from the same donor. So those patients still can be tested with Prospera. The other one is the recipient of, of the kidney from their identical twin. Because if you receive it from your identical twin, your gene and your DNA is exactly the same. So it's, we are not able to separate which one is from donor and which one is from the recipient. So in this case, you cannot do Prospera. Let's have some examples. Let's meet Mary. Mary is a 31 year old lady and she had the end of stage renal disease secondary to good pasture. She lived in a small town about 120 miles from her transplant center in Mississippi. This is her second kidney transplant. Why is it important? Because when you get the second kidney transplant, you consider high risk because your body has been exposed to the first kidney already. And in her case, she was very highly sensitized, which those numbers are reflected in her calculated panel reactive antibody on the CPRA, which was 98%, and she was also positive with DSA. So she lives far from the transplant center and often has trouble finding transportation to her appointment. She follow her care with her local nephrologist. So she presented to her local nephrologist in September 2020 with a slightly increase in creatinine level. So the local nephrologist couldn't make his mind that does this patient need to go back to transplant center knowing that they live so far and it's such a big hassle for her to go there or she, he should just monitor this patient and see where is it going? So to answer those questions, he decided to order a Prospera. He ordered a Prospera and the Prospera test came back at 2.69%. Remember when it's more than 1%, that put this patient high risk for rejection. Now the local nephrologist know that there is something happening in this kidney. So he referred Mary back to the transplant center. Transplant center did a biopsy and it shows antibody mediated rejection. This is a great example that shows the Prospera surveillance testing allows Mary's local nephrologist to make an informed decision to send her back to the transplant center for the biopsy, despite of just the slight increase in creatinine. The biopsy confirmed the rejection and she was able to receive the appropriate treatment in a timely manner and prevent it from further damaging to her kidney. Let's have another example. Let's meet Adam. Adam is 24 year old gentleman with the end stage renal disease secondary to Alport syndrome. He received his kidney transplant in 2019 when he was 22. It was his first kidney transplant, so he was not that sensitized. His CPRA was just 10% and DSA negative. Later on, in the pandemic of COVID, he had some flu-like symptom and diagnosed with COVID infection. He presented to his transplant nephrologist with a slight increase in creatinine while recovering from COVID. So that's a big question that why he has increased uh, the slight increase in the creatinine. Is it because of a COVID complication or is he rejecting? And with the creatinine, you're not able to have that answer. So a Prospera test was ordered and it shows a fraction of 0.69%. But remember, we talked that there is another number that we report in Prospera, which is the quanta score of the donor drive cell-free DNA. And that was 85 copies per ml. 
which was more than the 78 copies per ml threshold. So that shows that these patients and this slight increase in the creatinine is because of the rejection rather than the complication of the COVID. Due to this test result, he underwent a kidney biopsy, which confirmed the cellular mediated rejection. This is a great example that of using the Prospera to help the physician to identify the reason for increasing creatinine. It's very important because if it's secondary to the COVID infection, the treatment is decreasing the immunosuppression. And on the other hand, if it's a rejection, the response is increasing the immunosuppression. So in this case, because of the high risk Prospera results, the biopsy was performed and patient was able to receive appropriate treatment of the rejection in a timely manner. So here at Natera, we are with you at every step where we uh, have a wide range of patient services to ensure that you feel supported. We have education, we have a care team will guide you through the process and check in at every milestone. For the renal side, you have that complementary genetic information session with one of our board certified genetic counselors, pre and post test. And we also have flexible sample collection. For the blood samples, we offer a self-scheduled mobile phlebotomy appointment that you can schedule based on your availability. And for the renal side, it can be performed on saliva even, so you can receive the kit and there is an educational videos and pamphlet there that you know how to collect your sample. I hope you found this uh, symposium helpful. Thank you very much for your time and please feel free to let us know your question. Have a great day. I wanted to extend our thanks to Dr. Tabruziani for this talk and also wanted to thank you all for your participation today and the next session will be uh, starting momentarily. Thank you everyone.